Hello. Um, I'm, go I'm going to welcome up our next speaker. Our next speaker will be talking about why women engineers make the best CEOs. Tanya Fratto is the former CEO of GE's super abrasive business. Prior to that, she was the CEO of Diamond Innovations. She has an experienced skill set in operations, supply chain management, marketing, product management, Six Sigma, profit and loss, and portfolio management. Please join me in welcoming a woman with a wealth of experience, Tanya Fratto. I'm going to cheat and use notes. Normally they put me on the, uh, the panels. I like those better when we're just talking and answering questions. So we're going to give this keynote stuff a try. A try. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everyone here um, for inviting C200 to your campus today. Uh, it's really fun coming back to an engineering school and seeing the changes that have taken since, uh, since I graduated from engineering. I'm, I'm not quite as old as some of the people that were up here, but I'm not certainly not as young as you are. Um, and so uh, I graduated in 83 and uh, I had I graduated with an electrical engineering degree um, and so let me just tell you a little bit about myself before we get into the topic I grew up in a really really small town in Alabama um, and you know my goal in life uh, at that time was not to be an engineer or run a company or do any of those things it was to have a great tan and walk the beaches of Gulf Shores Alabama where I grew up um, so I won a scholarship to go to college and that's how I ended up in college and I had some teachers in high school much like Linda was talking about a math teacher I, I adored this math, math teacher that I had and she made a huge difference and because of that I, I, I turned out to be pretty good in math so I started out in college a math major and uh, somewhere along the line which is a, a story for another time uh, I, I got kind of uh, uh, directed by a uh, engineering, or, uh, actually a math professor, to go take a tour of the engineering school, and I didn't know what an engineer did, and I didn't know what the opportunities were if I had an engineering degree. Um, so I asked him the question, "Well, which one has the most math?" And he said, "Electrical." And I said, "Okay, I'll give that one a try." And that's how I ended up with an electrical engineering degree. I um, I lucked out and had an internship with an International Paper Company while I was in college, and internships make a huge difference. Um, so that, after I graduated, while I thought I was going to work with, uh, with International Paper Company, uh, the guidance counselor had made a deal with me that, you know, we had managed to attract all these great companies on our campus. We're small. University of South Alabama is not University of Florida. And uh, GE was interviewing. And they were interviewing for uh, medical technicians, the people that drive around and fix the stuff in the trucks. And, um, and while I had uh, no goal to go drive a truck and go into hospitals, and fix equipment, um, they wanted to see GE come back and I was the first woman engineer graduating from our college and they wanted to see we were progressive. And so the GE uh, recruiter that was on campus that day, I immediately, uh, he, he said to me, you don't look like somebody that would drive around and fix equipment. And I said, I'm not, but let me tell you about South Alabama. And I did a huge sales job on him with about how great my school was and why they wanted to come back and continue to recruit engineers there. And um, that led to a, a job offer to join their man, man, manufacturing management program. GE at the time was a huge manufacturer of products, and they had they put engineers either on a manufacturing track or an Edison engineering track and um, so nine locations in uh, 20 years and five different businesses in three different industries um, I had an incredible run with GE I was leading a company called GE Super Abrasives. We made industrial diamonds. Um, for those who don't know what industrial diamonds do, they're synthetically made and you use them in all kinds of tools. So when you go out to your car and you roll your window down, you see that pencil edge. It requires a diamond to do that pencil edge on those windows so you don't have sharp edges. Um, and if you're in electronics, you see it cutting uh, wafers and, uh, and uh, polishing uh, your, uh, your screens and television. So it was a really cool business. But GE had decided it didn't belong in that industry anymore and so uh, I partnered with a private equity firm. We bought the company away from GE. I ran it for three years, so I played in the private equity world for about three years before a Swedish company came in 
and uh, made us uh, an offer of twice what we had paid for it. And uh, so with a 60% IRR, we sold the company. And then in 2011, I started doing board work. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you just two things about the boards, because as you're searching for companies to go to work for when you graduate, um, both these companies are be being very progressive in terms of uh, 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 attracting women as well as uh, they def they desperately need engineers. So um, the first company is traded on the London Stock Exchange. They're called Smith's uh, Group. And they make the detection equipment that you see when you go into airports for trying to uh, figure out are people safe and is your baggage safe. Um, and they also make seals and bearings for like oil and gas industry. So they're a little bit of a conglomerate that still plays in the products industry. The other company, we actually have one of our civil engineers who's a grad from uh, University of Florida. Where are you? Are you still in the room? Stand up. <laughs> She is a civil engineer. She work, uh, works for Advanced Drainage Systems. We make those big uh, pipes that you see when you're laying in water systems and sewer systems. So you want to talk to her about utilizing your degrees, uh, talk to her. So, so that's a little bit about me. And now we're on to the topic of why do engineers make great CEOs? Well, Eleanor Roosevelt once said that the secret to a great speech is threefold, sincere, succinct, and be seated. So I was trying to think of how do you do this, you know, in, uh, in in that and uh, trying to come up with that and said, well, you know, this is very easy. I can just basically say, well, women are collaborative and engineers are smart. That's why we make great CEOs. That's seven words and I've just told you everything that to be a, a success. And if it were that easy, it would be terrific. Um, but it's not that easy, and you've heard this morning from some of the women who, are, who have blazed some trails and are continuing to blaze trails for you. And so I wanted to give you some thoughts on um, tools. I'm a big fan of like the Jay Leno top 10, or if you watch NCIS, you know Mark Harmon always has these rules for his team. And I'll just tell you a few tools that might help you along the way, give you some food for thought on um, what I've learned from some great CEOs and some not go so great CEOs. Remember, you can learn from those people who aren't good at things. Um, and a little bit of what my personal journey has uh, taught me as well. So rule number one, take notes. Um, know your audience and build your network. Now, I've noticed uh, a lot of people, by taking notes, it means they're really engaged in what you're talking. That's when you're learning from people. So today on the panels, I was taking notes, and I picked up three or four things that at the end of the day, I, I learned from the women who were up here earlier today. And hopefully, you're doing the same. But the real thing is to know your audience um, and, and build the network as you're, as you're meeting people. I mean, whether it's a customer or an employee group, whether it's a new technology or anything, you've got to think about how you're going to relate to it. So let's try this one out just a little bit today. How many of you are studying engineering in this room? It's an easy question, right? Okay. How many of you have had an internship or worked a summer job with your engineering degree? Okay. Still quite a few hands. How many of you know exactly what you want to do with your engineering degree when you get out of school? A few less hands. Okay, I'm glad to see that. You're not too different. I thought, well, the girls I've been meeting here, they're a lot more sophisticated than we were when I was graduating from college. But in 1983, we did, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated with an engineering degree. And unlike you, we didn't have Google or C200 forums or women in engineering groups or a lot of the other avenues that you've got today to help us think through what do we want to do with these engineering degrees. So... Here's a few thoughts as you start to think about what you really want to do. First of all, know your passion. Now, know what you really get excited about. For me, what I found from my internship in college is I really liked making stuff. Um, sitting behind the desk and actually designing it wasn't for me, so I knew research and development and PhD programs were probably not going to be for me. But if you put me on a shop floor where we were getting to make it and I got really excited about it. And then know your personality. Um, I wasn't a loner. I was the extrovert in my family. And being with teams and being with people and being out with customers really made a difference. So um, I knew that I was going to have to do something of that nature. The other thing is explore the various landscapes. When I graduated from college, I interviewed with everybody from the National Security Agency to the FBI. My dad had been a former FBI and was horrified that I was actually even thinking about doing that. 
Um, and, and, and I told you the GE story. So I looked at every different um, avenue and uh, ended up with GE. But the other thing is look at uh, the, the different industries that are out there. You know, if, if people say, well, would you choose electrical if you knew what you knew today? I said, well, maybe, but I might choose chemical because do you realize chemical engineers are employed by the cosmetics company? So, I mean, it, chemical engineers can go from anything from cosmetics to pharma to, you know, making plastics to making diamonds. Um, so, at the end of the day, every single one of you with the engineering disciplines you're in, even if you're civil engineer, I mean, civil engineers aren't just about road and bridge construction. There are a lot of other things that civil engineers are doing today. And companies not only hire engineers to design things, we get to make them, uh, we get to design the technologies behind uh, how they go, we get application engineers sell the product. We In Diamond Innovations, we had the single largest uh, application engineering group in machine tools. So when people were looking to design, design tools, they came to us. So we got to work on some pretty cool things, like when they were coming out with composite planes, the people who were designing the planes didn't think about that when you're drilling holes, um, that you can no longer use a standard drill. You actually have to have a diamond drill, because is that you're drilling into that composite material, it's heating it up, and what's it causing to do? It's causing it to de degrade, and the last thing you want is the hole getting bigger on the plane and the screw not fitting in. So we actually worked with Boeing and Airbus to help them design the tools for the new composite planes that are out there. So that was part of it. And then the other thing is think about whether you want a public company or a private company. At the end of the day, public companies like GE, IBM, Google, Apple, there, you can find out so much information about them and really explore whether that's going to be right, which leads me to rule number two. Think about the culture of the company that you're going to work for. Because when you take that very first job, it, it's important to research the company. Um, again, public companies, there's a lot of information that's out there about that company. But one of the things that I started to do is I would go in and I would ask, well, can I meet a few engineers or take a tour of the shop floor? If you, take, if you go on an interview and you take a tour of a shop floor or meet a, a few engineers who've joined that company in the first five years, you immediately find out the, about the culture of that company and it'll help you decide, is this something that you really want to do? Are these people that you're going to enjoy coming to work with every day? And it's going to really help you assess, assess that. Um, the other thing about knowing the culture of companies, it's not just the culture of companies, but it's the culture of places you're visiting. Um, I carried this whole curiosity element of trying to figure out cultures and people through the course of my career as I would uh, Diamond Innovations was a very global company. 70% of our revenues were outside the United States. And being a woman, uh, going into j places like Japan and Germany and Russia, you, you were a true anomaly. I mean, you just didn't exist in their culture, right? And so what I found myself doing is going in an extra day early and I would go to a museum or I would go to a castle or I'd go learn something about the history of that so that the next day when I started customer meetings I would say oh I toured such and such or I went to such and such place the CEOs that you're dealing with were so impressed that you were actually interested in their culture because they love talking about people in Japan love talking about the things in Japan same with China same with Germany people in general are the same everywhere right if I start talking to you and asking you about your don't you like talking about yourself? Yes, you do. And that's the way you find out information and that's the way you start to engage with people. So again, that culture does matter and it matters for you and being happy in what you do. That, rule number three, look back to look forward. Uh, this, this one, I worked for two different GE leaders and they had this tendency as you went in jobs to tell you, go back and look at 10 years of data. And at first I would think, 10 years, who cares? Um, but the interesting thing that I found is that um, as I would go into various business or even problems that you were trying to solve and exercise the rule, what you would start to see is when did step change occur? What was driving growth in the company or what was driving the downfalls in the company? And all of a sudden you would see the technology changes or you'd see the product changes or you'd see new markets that they'd gone into that all of a sudden they'd entered China and 
revenues went like this, or they entered China and revenues and profits went like this. But you could tell a lot about it, and by doing it, you could ask yourself, okay, I've looked at the last 10 years, now let's think about the next 10 years. What's the step change in the future? And what's going to help me grow? Because remember, if you really want to be a CEO, you've got to think about profits, growth, and you got to think about loss. At the end of the day, if you can't make the payroll, your company is not going to be successful, your shareholders are not going to be happy, and that's true regardless of whether you're a private company, a public company, or a $10 billion company, or a $25 million company. So, rule number four, build great teams and hire great talent. I'm sure this is a no-brainer for everybody here in, in this room. As you're working on your engineering projects, you only want to surround yourself with the best. And that is true. You do want to surround yourself with the best. So, But the funny thing is, um, you've got to think about how do I assess are they the best. So develop some interview skills that work. You know, one of the things I liked doing was taking people to lunch. Because at the end of the day, at lunch, you could watch how people were treating the waiters and the waitresses. At the, if people are not treating other people kindly, you've got to say, are they, are they really going to belong on my team? They may be the smartest person in the room, but if they can't get along with people, then that's uh, a very difficult uh, challenge for them. Um, I was telling the, our lunch table today, I had a young woman um, who was an engineer, graduated top of her class from Carnegie Mellon, one of the smartest uh, young engineers I'd ever met. She really wanted to be a CEO. Her social skills were not there. She did not know how to adapt, um, work with teams, um, surround herself with great people. She was a real loner. And so customers didn't like uh, you know, dealing with her, and it became a real problem for her. So that, that was my feedback to her. I gave her the constructive feedback. You're going to have to develop the social skills. You're going to have to build yourself. If you're not going to do it, you're going to have to send somebody there to meet with customers in the future. So... That goes along with being a good coach. So this, this rule of hiring great teams and building great teams, they go hand in hand. Um, you've, you do have to find the right interview techniques that work. But you, the other thing you've got to think about is developing the right game plans, um, the right measurements. Um, you've got to teach the talents to your team. Um, I know I'm in SEC territory here, and I'm a big football plan, fan. Having grown up in Alabama, you know, you always have to choose are we a roll tide or a war eagle. So I'm a Roll Tide girl, um, and but I'm wearing my Gator pin today. So, um, but but if you think about football, uh, what I've noticed about coaches, they they don't run the plays, right? They they develop them. That's what you're doing as a CEO. You're developing the plays that people want to run, and they don't throw the football. But what they can do is they can watch people throw in the football, and they can coach them on how to throw that football better. So for you to be a co good coach, you have to spend time with teams. You have to look at all of how they're in action. You also have to have that skill set that on how to give them that constructive uh, feedback in terms of that. And you have to make sure that you've given a lot of thought to the goals and objectives that you're given every person in the organization. It's easy to, to manage those people on the smart end. You know, somebody made that, one of the panelists made the comment, I thought everybody wanted to work hard like I did, okay? And that is what you think. Everybody wants to work hard. Um, but remember those Pareto curves you learn in, in engineering school, they exist in real life too. So when you get into the work world, you're going to have those people really smart. All you're going to have to do is tell them, go, and they are going to run. And then you're going to have the other people that if you don't have it well-defined, do these 10 things, they're not going to know what to do. So give some time on how to be a good coach and how to build the skill set on being a good coach. Rule number six is to think about taking the road less traveled. And this goes along with taking a risk. A lot of my success in GE came because I was taking the jobs nobody else wanted. When we were building a uh, plant in Burkeville, Alabama, which was the fifth poorest county in the United States to make very high quality plastic uh, Lexan, um, nobody wanted to go to Burkeville, Alabama. And so I went down on a project team to help build a plastics plant. That led me to corporate headquarters, which then led me to building a plant in Mexico, which led me to starting up a a business in uh, Hong Kong, which led me to running a, a diamond business in Ohio. So each step along the way, I'd taken jobs that people just didn't really want. They were, they, 
it was a trade-off. You know, family life uh, wasn't so great in Burkeville, Alabama. If you had kids that you, you wanted to put through a, a school system, but you know, for me, I was a young engineer, uh, five years out of college, and it's like, hey, this sounds fun. Let's go do it. Um, and the other thing to remember about taking jobs and risks is people will always look at whether you were successful two different ways. Um, I don't know her personally, but you, if you look at someone like Carly Fiorini at HP, there's two points of view on whether she's been a success. And one might look at, go back and say, well, look at what was happening to the computer industry. And you'd study the dynamics of the industry at that time, and you realize that she made the best of a very bad situation. Um, other people look at it and say she fired people. At the end of the day, you will always be criticized, but you will get noticed. So think about that as you choose that uh, um, path. Now the thing I will tell you about taking the diff difficult paths is you do build a lot of sk skill sets. And one of my favorite sayings in GE was that in a, strong in a strong wind a turkey can fly. But what happens when that wind stops? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's easy when a company is growing you know, everything is hunky-dory, but when that wind does stop, if you don't have the skill sets to, to really uh, manage through those storms, then it becomes more, more difficult. Um, rule seven, focus on the critical X's and develop substance behind everything you do. Um, some of you may have had some exposure to Six Sigma, Lean Engineering. Um, during my journey at GE, I had that opportunity to lead a Six Sigma organization for GE's appliance business. We were roughly about $10 billion in revenue at the time. We had plants all over the world. And the thing that I started to learn is that many times we would start out and say, well, the problem is and the solution is this. And we would immediately jump to exactly what we thought. But as we started to really truly study and go through, well, okay, this happens and this happens and this happens and go really dig down into the details, we would find what the true root cause was. And what we found many times is that we were putting band-aids over things versus really fixing things. So you're engineers, you understand this in terms of formulas. Spend time thinking through, if I make this proposal to do this and then this happens, well, what's going to be the response of my manager? Or what's going to be the response of the competitor? Or what's going to be the response of the customer? Because many times if you, all you can answer is one question, it means you haven't thought through the substance element of the proposal that you're coming out with. So again, focus on details there. Um, Linda mentioned this in hers in Rule Eight, and uh, it's it, it's it, we as engineers we love formulas, so you'll love the pie. PIE, performance image exposure. It was about the only formula that I found within GE that I could actually lose, use. And, um, you know, performance is your ticket in the door. Whatever job you do, do that job and do it well. You know, don't go into a job thinking, okay, I'm here six months and I'm going to move on. If you go in to design something, recognize that you need to do a good job doing that. But then the exposure element of this comes about that road less traveled in the types of projects that you're taking on. And the image aspect of the way you dress, the way you talk, the tact that you have when managing through difficult situations, um, your image and your exposure out there is so important. And image for you is probably even more important for us today. I always joke with my sorority sisters when we get back together, thank God we didn't have Facebook when we were in college. Um, but you really do need to think about that. Social media is a really terrific thing. Um, but one of the reasons Rebecca probably can um, run for house is, you know, she didn't have Facebook either in her days. <laughs> and so we would assume that she was kind of boring. But I bet if we found somebody with some pictures of her in her college days, we might have some fun with her. And that's what you need to think about. And she's not kidding you when you are under a spotlight. Everything you wear, you say, you do... It is. Now, don't get paranoid about it. You can't be paranoid about it. But you do have to give some thought to it as you go out there in terms of what what's the image I'm doing and what's the exposure that I'm building. There are other ways to get exposure. You don't have to be at the top. As you start out, you'll find within companies, in GE, we did a lot for Habitat for Humanity. Leading the project for that gave you exposure to the CEO as a young engineer because many times they wanted to work on it, come get their picture taken. 
you know, uh, that they're doing good for the community. So you would always get exposure in terms of how that project's going to run. So think about how you get that exposure as you choose the company you want to join. Rule number nine, be yourself and live your dream. While we're here today talking about why we think engineers would make great CEOs, because we would love to see more women in the C-suite, I think it's important to tell you if you're happy being an engineer, be an engineer. Um, we want to see women in all roles in the future being successful and having that opportunity um, because we want the best people running businesses. We want the best people designing our products. We want the best people marketing our products. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be your dream, not someone else's. And I will tell you, it's not an easy journey. Um, and, and it's not all about having the perfect plan. Some of this, you can lay out the perfect plan and someone's going to throw a wrench in it. This is a little bit about a timing. You know, the right timing takes place. It's about having the right skills when that opportunity comes along. And it's a little luck as well along the way. So um, the prize is there for you to have it. You can, ha you can have it all. You might not have it all at one time. It may come at different times in your life. And you will hear various opinions on this from women as they get on the stage. Some people say, you can have it all. What I'll tell you is, you can have it all. It just may come at different times. It's not all going to come at the same time. And as you think about that dream, if you want to be a public CEO, just remember, you're serving at the pleasure of a board. It's no longer your company. There is a board of people that you have to keep uh, happy. And one of the biggest mistakes that I see is I serve on the board of two companies. And... Um, the biggest thing that, uh, that I see is that they, they really don't know how to use their boards, engage their employees. Uh, they think it's their company, their plan. And it, it, then remember, when you, as you go further and further up the top, it still is about how the team works. It's not about you. Which leads me to rule number 10. Life's a journey, it's not a destination. I worked for this guy one time, had to have been the worst person in the world I ever worked for. Hated every minute I worked for him. But at the end of the day, this is the one thing he taught me that has truly made a difference. Um, that life is a journey, it's not a destination. A lot of people talked about as they got started in their career, they worked and worked those 10 and 12 hours a day. They were, we were, we we're all going somewhere. We're not sure where we're going, but we are going. Um, and everyone has a different journey, but unlike the formulas you're studying in uh, engineering or like MapQuest I use to find my way here. Um, there isn't a formula or an app in life on where, where your journey is. So um, you have to, to, to kind of adapt and be flexible along the way. And, and just when you think you're getting too old, I'll give you two stories about people to think about that can inspire you. The first person's a man who was forced to retire by his company at the age of 60. And at 65, he had decided he wasn't done, so he started traveling by cars to restaurants and trying to sell a special recipe for chicken. He was de denied 1,099 times before a restaurant agreed to take his recipe. And 600 franchises later, Colonel Sanders sold his company for $2 million. And we all know him today as Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? The second person was a woman who found herself in a dilemma after her husband had died. Um, he had always been the driver. She was solely dependent upon him, and now she's in her early 70s, and she was being forced to take a bus, and she lived in Korea. She was determined she was going to get her driver's license, so she took the test 957 times before passing. <laughs> Hyundai heard her story, gave her a new automobile and put her in the starring role of their commercials when they were first starting out. So her name is uh, Cha Sa Soon and uh, she's very famous in Korea. So hopefully the top 10 rules here have been helpful for you today, these tools to help you think about it. Hopefully you listened to number one and took some notes about things that uh, you want to take away from it. And at this point, I'm sure that you are actually feeling just a little bit overwhelmed about all the advice you've been given since 9 o'clock. But let's go back to rule number nine about being yourself. Uh, when you leave here today, I think it's important for you to take time to reflect on what you've heard. Um, you can't do everything that you've heard today since 9 o'clock. If I tried to do everything that I heard today, I think I'd go, ah, like this. Um, but you probably heard one or two things that you want to put in your toolkit. And you say, I'm going to give this one a try. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I start interviewing people as I go out. Or I'm going to map 
the people that work in the company and see what it took that CEO to get to where he or she is today. Whatever it is, build your own playbook for success and keep those notes along the way because um, that's the other part of being yourself. You know, they say about advice, uh, somebody said, well, they didn't take my advice. Well, maybe the advice didn't work for them or maybe it did. Um, it's great to get advice, but you, you but if only if it works for you should you do it. If it's something you're going to truly be uncomfortable with, you shouldn't. Now, I say that with a little bit of a, a caveat to it, and that sometimes you've got to go outside your comfort zone. So be careful to ask yourself why are you not willing to do that. But again, take some advice, and because um, you can't blindly follow it. And the, the example I'll give you in my life: I worked in Mexico for three years, and when I first took this job in Mexico, it was supposed to be about a 12-month assignment. So my boss said, don't worry, you're only going to be there for 12 months. Don't worry about learning Spanish. Well, three years later, I was still there. And I always think today, if I'd spent three years utilizing my Spanish, I would uh, be a little bit further than un poquito. Um, so again, you know, uh, be careful about uh, always uh, listening to the advice you get. Sometimes you might want to try something a little bit different. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions that you might have. There's one back there. I don't know who's got the... I think they want you to come to the mics. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Very nice presentation. You're very welcome. I have a question regarding when um, you have work constraints. So your workload is the same. It's not changing. Your people are reducing. And you're trying to lead them and keep them happy and move them forward. At the same time, you need to produce, but you're coaching at the same time. How do you accomplish the task of coaching and creating a productive group of people that are also feeling the pinch of a reduced workforce? Yeah. Um, do you work for GE? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it doesn't matter whether you work for GE or any other large company. Uh, as, as times get tough, profit and loss uh, starts to matter, and everyone starts to feel the pinch. The, best, the, the biggest tool that I found was sitting down and kind of thinking about um, everything that you're being asked to do. Uh, when, when we were part of the private equity world and they were asking us to do too much, I would basically walk in and say, look, you've got 20 20 things on our plate. We probably could do 10 of them really well. Let's talk about what you want to either push off till next year or what you want to replace. But getting on the sheet of paper, and, and, and literally, people can make a mistake of over committing. So thinking about how to write down what you're being asked to do, and looking at it, and then going in and having an honest dialogue with your team and with your, with your boss, and making sure that you know what those priorities are, it's going to be about the only way that you can kind of be successful and accomplish everything you need to do with less resources. And, and, and the way to start thinking about how you think the priorities should be, what delivers top line growth, what delivers um, uh, profits to the company, and put those kind of at the top. Um, and, and, you know, that's about the only thing that I, I will tell you that I found uh, that works. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and to that point, adding to that, because uh, someone was talking about managing networks and saying, yeah, as you build your network, you know, how do you stay connected? Um, we had this one guy in GE, and he was absolutely the best at networking. And, and the, one day I took a look at his calendar, and he had, he had a, you know, people know these perpetual calendars, you know, there's no year on him, you just got January, February, and it's got all the dates. He had people's birthdays listed in there, it's like, okay, January, you could go down and look at whatever day in January and it was your birthday, et cetera. And he had this calendar where he would touch people twice a year, okay, birthdays and Christmas, no, holiday time frame. And so twice a year there was a group of people he was always touching but always staying connected with. And then there was kind of more of what I'll call his top ten list. These were people he called every week and he would have a 
two or three people a day. And he, today was Monday, I'm going to call John and I'm going to call Mary. I thought that was fabulous. And um, the interesting thing about doing this is I started doing this with my customer base. This is how it led, talk about networking. I ended up on the bo my first board of a mining company because one of the customers I had when I was in Diamond Innovations always remembered his birthday and I was the only supplier who ever remembered his birthday. So when he saw that I was leaving Diamond Innovations and had sold the company, he called and said, hey, come be on this board with me. That's how I got on a board. I didn't throw my resume out there. It was true networking. So do think about tools like whether it's prioritizing your top 10 of what you're working on, making sure that you and your boss are in sync with what are your goals and objectives, um, as well as managing your networks because your work and performance is equally as important as the people that you're networking and staying in contact with. Yes? Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you. There's been so much good advice that I've heard in today in general, but yours as well. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I had a question about was how you mentioned you had this trip to Mexico, and it seemed like it was a short period of time, but turned into years. Uh, I was wondering how you approached that or how that happened and the experiences you got from that. Well, I think I picked up a lot working in Mexico. I was there for three years. We had built a gas range uh, plant, so I was running this gas range business. It was with a joint venture partner. Um, we built this huge plant. It was empty. The product wasn't selling in the marketplace, and we weren't making any money. So uh, I was sent in to see if we could figure out how to fix this thing. And... Um, you know, working in Mexico, uh, th the first of all, you had to remind yourself uh, things move just a tiny bit slower than they do. They still do today, okay? Uh, you hear cinco minutos and five more minutes <laughs> truly means it could be, you know, 15 minutes from now or tomorrow. Um, but the thing that you did have to find is you kind of had to work that in, in terms of the it, they, they worked at a different pace. The other thing is they work differently than we do, and this goes back to knowing your cultures. In Mexico, if I were to begin a meeting with an agenda and go right into the meeting, I was going to get nothing done. If I began the meeting by saying, so Rebecca, how was your weekend? What, what, what did you and your family do this weekend? How's your daughter doing? And we spent about 15 minutes on just the what I call the courtesies of getting to know people. The rest of the meeting went really, really well, and we got everything done on the agenda, only because there was a connection there. Um, it's the same if you go to Japan. It's the same if you go to Germany. And when you get outside the United States, relationships become a lot more important in terms of doing business. Um, and I think I really learned that in Mexico more so than I had learned, because I was still, that was my first, like, international assignment, um, you know, if you want to call Mexico international. Um, it's now more part of us than ever. But at that time, there was definitely, you know, a difference in culture, and, and it still is today, so. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your impressive rules and very, very nice speech. I have a question not uh, directly about, you know, technical engineering issues. Uh, I have a question for your personal life. If you've been told that you would have one year off, time will stop, and your business, everybody's business will stop, nothing would change in a year. You would have your position, and your company will start working in a year. What would you do in that year? <laughs> Ooh, I'd got to work for that company. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, again, this comes about knowing the culture of the company. If this is something that you see others doing in the company and it's... Well, the company will stop working. Time will stop. Oh. And this is just you and your life. Yeah, I don't know. This is like at saying, uh, if you go to the zoo, what animal do you want to be? Um, yeah, <laughs> which I, I've never answered that question. I really don't know what I would do. I mean, in GE, it was not uh, something that you... That GE's culture under Jack Welch is very different than GE's culture is today under Jeff Emmelt. And you've got some wonderful recruiters here from GE if you want to talk to them about GE today. I left that company in uh, 2004. So it's changed a lot in uh, 12 years. But this goes back to knowing the culture of the company. If I were to take a year off today, um, I'd, I'd 
don't know, I, I would spend my time learning. I mean, at the end of the day, continuous learning is so important. Um, I'd probably spend, um, I'd probably spend some time on campus learning all the difference between some of the terms that I heard today that I had no clue what they were talking about on social media. You know, I'm still catching up with Facebook and Instagram and, uh, and, and you've moved way beyond that. So just staying in touch with whatever the changing technologies are, uh, the, the, you know, the changing environments, um, you know, I would spend time learning. And continuous learning is extremely important to you as you move forward. So. That's about the best I can do with that one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? One final thought. We talked a little bit about one of the questions that was asked on the panel. This is getting a little bit off women engineers, but we talked about what um, effect society has on our uh, young uh, women today and young men in terms of um, engineering and why they may or may not be choosing engineering. We did a study a few years ago, 14-year-old um, girls, and uh, the 14-year-olds say, oh, I want to help people when I grow up. And then when you say, well, what do you view as helping people? Oh, doctors help people, nurses help people. They don't view people as uh, engineers help people. So one challenge we've got is showing them how engineers make our lives better. You know, you show up an Apple phone, did this life make your life better? And the, oh yeah, that made well. An engineer had to design that. Um, the other thing we have to do is make it cool to be an engineer. And we were talking at our lunch table. If I were to come to uh, Florida when Tim Tebow was here, I bet everybody on campus knew who Tim Tebow was because it's cool to be an athlete or it's cool to be a American Idol or a you know voice winner. Um, at the end of the day, those are cool things that our society today puts on a pedestal. Um, we we're talking about University of Florida. You actually have the engineer who, in, who had invented the Sensodyne toothpaste. Um, I don't know how many of you knew that. I didn't know it until I was sitting at the table and, and uh, Kim Jacobs mentioned, oh, yeah, well, the guy from, who invented Sensodyne toothpaste. We got to be cool to be uh, Sensodyne toothpaste as much as we are winning American Idol. And that's where if you're giving back into the uh, middle schools and in there, um, show them how cool it can be because at the end of the day, um, when you go back 20 years from now and you're doing your high school reunions, um, I will bet, and I'll bet you anything if I were uh, in Las Vegas and placing bets, you as engineers will have been more successful than all of the other people who didn't choose that path. Because the one beauty that you have today of graduating with an engineering degree you, you can choose the path. You can go research and development. You can go public company. You can go private. You can be entrepreneurial. That, that path is yours there to take because of engineers. And so today when we read about people graduating and having a tough time getting a jobs, we're talking about people in the liberal arts. And that's not to put the liberal arts colleges down. But we desperately need in our society today and in the U.S. today, we need more people who are interested in that science, that technology, that engineering and math. And once it's cool again to be an engineer like it is in Japan, like it is in Germany, then what the U.S. is going to see is an, uh, just a huge um, increase in terms of engineering students. In, the, in Florida, you'll get even bigger in your engineering school today. So thanks again today for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.